Hello. Uh, good evening, if you are in my time zone, or good morning, if you are in Mark Toscano's time zone. I'm very happy to have been invited by the Fondazione to give a little talk. The occasion is one of my favorite filmmakers, Robert Breer, but I'm not really an expert on Robert Breer, or at least not to that degree that Mark Toscano, who you will hear afterwards is. So I'm kind of glad that Mark will take over for this. And what I will try to do instead is to give you a little overview of the history of avant-garde film, not the entire history of avant-garde film, but up to the point where Robert Breer comes in, who, in my opinion, is one of the few persons who has developed a full body of work that cannot be compared to anything else in cinema. And he has done so by picking up ideas that have circulated earlier in avant-garde film. So actually what I'm doing is I take Robert Breer as a pretext or maybe as a vantage point to give you an overview of how the idea of avant-garde film or maybe even film started. I'll start with a personal note. I discovered Robert Breer um, here at the Film Museum in Vienna, where I work, the Austrian Film Museum, whose co-founder, Peter Kubelka, is also an important avant-garde filmmaker. And he has programmed a cycle that is just called Was ist Film? What is Film? That tries to give you an overview of the inherently cinematic ideas that have existed through the 100 years, or a bit more, you could say, that analog film has been in place like from the very late 19th century to, you could say, the very early 21st century. And in this cycle, he has, pro he has devoted two programs to Robert Breer and his wonderful animation work, which is not only animation work, which is already a rarity because most other filmmakers just get one film in, or maybe two, or maybe one program, but only Robert Breer and maybe two or three others get two programs of their own because what they do is so unique. It's also maybe not a coincidence that Peter Kubelka and Robert Breer are together in the same chapter in the book called Visionary Film by P. Adam Sidney, which is kind of the foundational book on the American avant-garde cinema. And there's a reason that both of them are in the same chapter because Peter Kubelka, born in Austria, like me, is an Austrian, went to the US, so he's not a native American filmmaker, but he became very important for the American avant-garde. And Robert Breer, although he is an American, actually started out to make films in the early 50s in Paris when he was there as a painter. So Breer actually, and this connects him to many other important early avant-gardists, comes from painting to cinema. And he also balances the American side of the avant-garde movement and the European side of the avant-garde movement. Because when he was in Europe in the 50s, he actually first discovered some European avant-garde filmmaking, even though it did not influence him. I will start with two or three quotes by Breer himself to describe the situation where he began making film. He said in an interview, first, I was a painter. In Paris, I was influenced by the geometric abstractions of the neoplasticians following Mondrian and Kandinsky. It was big at the time, and I began painting that way. My canvases were limited to three or four forms, each one hard edged and having its own definite color. It was a rather severe kind of abstraction, but already in certain ways, I had begun to give my work a dynamic element which showed that I was not entirely at home within the strict limits of neoplasticism. Also, the notion of absolute formal values seemed at odds with the number of variations I could develop around a single theme, and I became interested in change itself, and finally, in cinema, as a means of exploring this further. I wanted to see if I could possibly control a range of variations in a single composition. You can see that I sort of backed into cinema since my main concern was with static forms. In fact, I was even a bit annoyed at first when I ran into the problems of movement. Brie is not the only painter, as we will see soon, that has moved into cinema. And he's actually solving some problems for himself that other people have solved before him. And this will be the trick of my lecture, basically. Because what I'm trying to do to you is to bring you up to the point where Robert Breer starts making films 
and to see what is already there in avant-garde, what will he rediscover himself, and what will he elaborate on in totally unique ways, which Mark will tell you about later on. But to um, bring up something else is Bria. Also, let me see, does this work? I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Um, Bria actually reinvented a handful of things that had been invented earlier. He has also talked about this in interviews. What you are seeing now is a very early animation film by the great French animator Emile Cole, who was the first, actually the first major figure in animation. And that is also something that is very interesting about Bria, that he is in a sidebar of the avant-garde or the experimental film that is treated often as something else, which is animation. But the way he uses it and the way he also makes it interact with, well, live action photography or freeze frames in later works adds to what he's doing. Because the way he treats animation and the way he treats what you would call realistic photography enhances each other. But Bria was very easygoing on theory. So maybe I'm also betraying him by giving a theoretical framework to what he's doing. He started to explain. When he got into filmmaking, I did what I've always done. I skipped cinema history and started at the beginning. I used very peculiar techniques because I did not know how to animate. That I would do what Emil Cole did makes sense. You know Santayana's line about how, if you don't know something, you're doomed to relive it. I'm still working out things that people worked out years ago. My rationale is to not risk being influenced, but in truth, it might just be laziness. I think it makes sense to do research, which Bria did not do, but well, if you see some of his films later and we'll get to that, you will see that he often uses very simple forms of animation to achieve very complex effects. Emil Cole, as you see in this image, also used very simple forms of animation. But back then, actually, he was one of the first persons to even invent ways of animating on film. And although this may look very simplistic to us, if we look at this image, it was so difficult for him to animate this. This is part of a six or seven minute film that he said, ah, this is too much. And actually, he quit animating again after a while. Or at least he did not make films alone anymore. Um, the other thing, and this is a much more important influence that we are coming to um, for Robert Breer, is the work of Hans Richter, a German who was part of the very first important avant-garde movement, which was called um, the Absolute Film. And Hans Richter, um, he also was a painter, interestingly, in the beginning. He also worked in other art methods, but most important to him uh, became, after a while, cinema. So in that sense, I guess you could compare him to Bria. And he started out in the 20s. Basically, the bigger part of what I'm talking about has only to do now with silent cinema. The question of sound will not be touched in my lecture, but uh, Hans Richter, was one of the first artists who conceived of film not just as a window to the world, which is very often the first comparison that we make when we look at the cinema screen, we say, ah, it's like a window to the world. But he also conceived of it as a canvas, as something you can paint on. And in his first films, he tried to explore that canvas and what cinema can do with it. So for at the beginning, and to give you an idea in which field we are working, I would now like to show a film by Hans Richter. It is called Rhythm, Rhythmus 21, Rhythm 1921. It was made in the year 1921, but screened only a few years later. So the title 21, which came to me is a bit misleading. And here he's doing breakthrough work, what cinema can do with abstract painting. I am hoping that Elisa, who is working for me, with me from the Fondazione, can us now show this beautiful film by Hans Richter. Please start.
Ah, beautiful. Indeed, especially if you see it here on the screen, it looks very much like painting directly on the screen. But maybe there's something I want to point out because it's very important for the films that we discuss. They were, of course, all made on analog film, on 16 millimeter, on 35 millimeter, and they're meant to be projected in the cinema. So if you see a film like Hans Richter's Rhythmus 21, really in a cinema, although you have this flat surface on the screen, what you also can see in the darkened cinema is the light of the projector beam coming down when you have these big white spots in the midst of the darkness. So there is also a sense of volume, but there it's pure light. It's a volume of pure light. And I think it adds to this feeling of watching a painting when you see a film like this on the screen. In any case, Richter is an anchor point for me, not only because he was such an important influence on Breer, who would, I will get to that later, uh, um, but also because he was maybe a driving key factor. He was not the only person, but maybe the central person of the early avant-garde movement in the 20s, which manifested itself mostly in Germany and in France. It was parallel actually to other developments in the plastic art. Surrealism plays a role, Dadaism plays a role at this time. But they, he, Richter, and his good friend, actually, the King Egeling, belongs to those people who try to invent something like modern art for the cinema. What they are saying, and this is also a question that I'm thinking about, or that is in the back of my mind as I'm talking about all this, the idea of experimental film or avant-garde film, it's not really defined. We will get to that. It's a bit like the old saying, I know it when I see it. But there has been a fight about what these terms could mean. Back then, they were considered avant-garde, like in other arts. And one of the key elements for this early avant-garde movement, for this filmic avant-garde movement, happened in the year 1925. In Berlin, at the Uferpalast, there was a cinema screening on Sunday, May 3rd, of a group. The screening was promoted under the title The Absolute Film. The Absolute Film, which also came to mean something else. So we are still in the area of fluent definitions. But what was shown there were, on one hand, the films of Richter and of a few other people, who I'm going to show you images at least, to give you a bit of an idea what their films look like. We are moving away from Emil Kohl to people like Walter Ruppmann, who made films, you can see here two film frames above each other. So the idea is that you can imagine the movement that happens when you watch the film. The point is it shorter and it gets bigger in the second screen, so it's an abstract form that moves. And Ruttmann, interestingly, also used color, unlike Richter, who still made his films in black and white. There was also a performance by Ludwig Hirschfeld Mack, which had invented a type of color organ, so he was not really showing cinema, but was kind of animating pictures, a bit like visual music. And the concept of visual music, although we are here dealing with silent films, is very important, actually, for all these people who make these abstract films in the beginning. Walter Ruttmann made a handful of Opus films. Here is another one, Opus 4. Where you can also intuit the movement that he has. And then there is the good friend of Richter called Viking Eggeling. They work together. He made only one film called Symphonie Diagonal, the Diagonal Symphony, which is related to Richter's films, but his surfaces are even much more planar. And I will now give you an overview of here are several frames from these films in one image. And when you look at it, you can see that the movements work in a way like point-counterpoint. When one of the two forms gets bigger, the other form gets smaller. When the movement goes in this direction, there will be a counter-movement in the other direction. So Eggelin's film is a bit more pure, but it also lacks that voluminous quality that I described earlier with Richter. But interestingly enough, um, there are also films that contain not just it's not only about abstract painting, although there is this idea of making film an outgrowth of painting or of using it like painting. But there is another filmmaker who is actually a painter, Fernand Leger, who made together with the director Dudley Murphy the wonderful film called Ballet Mechanique, which starts actually with an animated sequence. So you can see a drawing of Charlie Chaplin 
lifting his head, greeting you. It's a bit rudimentary, but knowledgeable, uh, but recognizable. But he also includes in his films many objects, bottles, for instance. But also, yeah, no, too far, sorry, this one I wanted. But also like this shot of a woman, but if you look at her, the way her eyes are closed, she almost looks like a puppet. And these shots of the woman are actually intercut with the feet of a puppet. So that's the reason why the film is called Ballet Mechanique. It's like we are entering a world of objects. We are even the, the real life elements basically are like something painted. That is one of the important ideas of the avant-garde of experimental film that you do not just reproduce reality like it's often assumed with documentary film, although it's much more complex, of course, because each documentary filmmaker already makes a choice just by choosing his viewpoint. But that everything you put on screen is something formed, something made for the cinema. You do not just record reality, you invent reality. There was another film shown called Entracte by René Clair, who later became a famous and very good fiction filmmaker. And it was made as an intermission for a Dadaist ballet. Um, that's why it's called Entracte. And this film actually does not really at first glance fit in with all the other films that I've shown you examples now, because it's not abstract. It is all real life things, but it's almost like a comedy. It brings us back to Chaplin that we saw at the beginning of the Le Chier film, because things happen like a person dies and the hearse is moving through the city, but the hearse is not driven by is not drawn by horses, it's drawn by cameras. And suddenly it begins to move faster and faster and the people start running after it. So it's a very absurd film. And it gives us an idea of this movement in the twenties of being very alive, of trying to provoke, trying to find new things, of breaking actually through the possibility of what film can be, something that is basically encapsulated in this very beautiful image where in the end somebody is breaking through the screen itself, through the thin, the, the, the end sign that we have at the end of the movie. So apart from these filmmakers that were shown in the series, the absolute film, there are many related ones that, that experiment on similar things at the time. They also all come from France and Germany. It's quite interesting. This is the only movement in the avant-garde history before the Second World War. And it's really hand in hand with artists. There are so many painters in there. One of the next key figures is Man Ray, who is, of course, much more famous for his other arts. But he also made a handful of films, all of them wonderful. And one of the best is called Retour à la raison, Return to Reason, which is, of course, an ironic title, because in truth, other is spirit he's actually trying to make you see the world differently. And what he's using are a handful of different things. One major element is a naked woman's torso, which you can see here. But another element is something that he also used in his art, the so-called rayographs, which are a bit like X-rays, maybe you could say, but negative X-rays of something you see. So here you have an image of nails, actually, that is treated as a rayograph and becomes this abstract composition. The funny thing is that um, Ray wanted to show this film at the Dadaist um, gathering, and he had not really finished the film, and only at the last minute got the idea to make it better by including those rayographs. And so what he did actually was um, to insert many of these shots of these rayographs at the last moment, which led to the sad fact that the copy that he showed was spliced rather badly. <laughs> um, and that the film broke down several times. So although this film is only three or four minutes long, there were many intermissions. And although people just saw glimpses of this and that, it caused a huge uproar. The, there, was, there were fights in the audience, some people screaming, this is absolutely great what he's doing. It's absolutely new. Other people said, what is this crap, basically? So there was a fight in the audience only over these few abstract images, which also gives you maybe an idea of the excitement back then in trying to come up with new artistic solutions. Because of course, other stories, we will get to films like Un Chien Andalou by Bunuela Dali, which has shocking images, that those films, of course, caused an uproar you can still imagine today. 
But this film that has only mostly abstract content manages to cause an uproar as well. So you can see what this really, what the fight back then is really about is actually maybe to try to get a new definition of cinema to achieve breakthroughs in art, which what experimental film is of course about because it was so back then and it is still the same way now. When people talk about movies, usually they mean feature films. They mostly mean fiction films, occasionally documentary. But the avant-garde is actually a very limited area, which is very strange to me because in many ways, it is the pure cinema. It is that element of cinema that tries to discover the things that only cinema can do. Jonas Mikas, a very important avant-garde filmmaker from the US, once said a wonderful sentence, many people say that they love movies, but what they really mean is that they love stories. And I think that hits the point that is misunderstanding. But at the same time, many avant-garde films, at least to me, and that's why I love it so much, are not that difficult. They are not theoretically, not strange experiments, but they are very alive on a very sensual level which is something we will get to again with Bria when we see his films and a few other examples that I'm going to show you. But uh, there's something that draws you in and makes it very easy actually to watch avant-garde films. They are intuitively understandable. So it is kind of strange that it has always been this sideline form. And maybe I want to give you just a quick quote by Fernand Lecher, who on the occasion of this exhibition Absolute Film made a text, wrote a text called A New Realism, The Object, where basically he calls already, he issues a call that film should be seen differently, that all current cinema is romantic, literary, historical, expressionist, etc., etc. Let us forget all this and consider, if you please, a pipe, a chair, a hand, an eye, a typewriter, a head, a foot, and so on and so on. And so these images that he conjures in your head basically do not tell you a story, they give you plastic impressions. And here is where Lecher, for instance, says a new idea of cinema could start because what he thinks is that cinema might find out the perfect way to show you these objects. He says, to get the right plastic effect, the usual cinematographic methods must be entirely forgotten. The question of light and shade becomes of prime importance. The different degrees of mobility must be regulated by the rhythms controlling the different speeds of projection. The timing of projections must be calculated mathematically. What he says then, it's like a futurist thing, he says, new men are needed. Men who have acquired a new sensitiveness toward the object and its image. An object, for instance, if projected 20 seconds, it's given its full value. But if it's projected 30 seconds, it becomes negative. It was in there too long. So this idea that Leger demands, but does not develop because Ballet Mechanique is his only film, is something that is realized in the work of later filmmakers. And if you ask me, Robert Breer is one of them. Leger, however, is not the only theoretician. In fact, our friend Hans Richter may be an even more important figure when it comes to considering what the theory of film can be. Um, although Rudolf Arnheim, a very important writer on film, really demolished what Richter showed in the screening, this absolute film, I translated it from his German review back then, ultimately, uh, ultimately Hans Richter's uninspired babble is only suited to discredit the entire movement. Richter actually was a boom to the movement. And not only that, he expanded his ideas continually as he kept on working, even though he would only occasionally work in film. But a very important moment comes in the summer of 1929, which also maybe not by coincidence is near the end of the silent era. Sound film has already started. You could say around 1930, sound film starts to dominate. But at this point, we are still dealing mostly with silent films. And there is a big exhibition by the German Werkbund in 1929, for which Richter organizes a series called The Artistic Film. And it includes, of course, the films I've already mentioned that were shown in the series The Absolute Film, but also of their French colleagues. But Richter also shows films by Charles Chaplin. He shows what is back then the big thing, the Russian films by Sergei Eisenstein and Ziga Bertov, who are also so important because they have theoretically new ideas, avant-gardistic ideas, 
actually that will also influence not just normal fiction filmmaking, but also avant-garde filmmaking. That he's also showing more conventional films, like say the films by G.W. Pabst, an Austrian filmmaker who worked in Germany and famous for his films with Louis Brooks, like Pandora's Box. But he also made a film about psychoanalysis called Secrets of the Soul, which is very interesting in trying to translate something that the surrealists also worked on, dreamlike ideas into a film story, which is also something that back then is in vogue, this idea that films are also like your dreams. And Richter actually, although he wants to show the film, is for instance very unhappy that Pabst is also invited because he says, ah, but he's too conventional to be here as a speaker. He would much rather talk to people like Eisenstein or people like Vertov, to filmmakers who make another kind of absolute film, which is quite interesting to realize that although we have now associated with mostly graphic works, another thing that is coming to be called in the time are exactly, wait, I'm here too far. Yeah, these Russian films. Here we have, for instance, a shot from Vertov, the man with the camera. His idea is the key image. You can really see the eye and the camera, they become one. And you have this man of the, with the camera moving through the crowds. At the same time, there are German films like Berlin, uh, Symphonie einer Großstadt, Symphony of a City, again by Walter Ruttmann, by whom I, before I showed this abstract opus films. And here he tries to portray a metropolis, tries to give a feeling of this new metropolitan life, of this pulsating speed. And of course, for that, in a very different way, he comes back to similar ideas, to ideas that are associated with the absolute film, this idea that film is written, that film is montage. But you can do it also not just with abstract things, but um, with real images or with images of reality. And Richter, at the time of organizing this Congress, actually develops ideas that go further and he makes, he starts writing a book that comes out that very same year. And it's a book, unfortunately here, it's very small, that has one of my favorite titles. It's called Filmgegner von heute, Filmfreunde von morgen. Enemies of film today, friends of film tomorrow. And in it, he tries to explain what makes film so special, what makes it unique. And I guess it's worth quoting in full the intro, also because I translated it from German to English. I think there is no English version of this book. And Richter begins with the momentous sentence, are you an enemy of film? The way film today is, it cannot have enough enemies. Today's enemy of film has a cultural mission to fulfill, to fight the bad film, to protest, to protest against bad films, to organize the protest. The more enemies of film, the greater the chances for better films. Don't believe what they tell you, that film has to be bad because that is what the audience wants. You yourself are the audience. Do you want those films that you are offered today? Don't you also think that film might not be better? We want to show you that film has rich artistic means. We want to show you its principles to enable you to not just feel which films are bad, but also to know why. We want to improve your ability to judge so you can demand a better film. Or if you are a film expert, we want to appeal to your sense of responsibility. Can you step aside in the face of developing these artistic possibilities? You have to act out against the bad film. You all should learn to despise the bad film, even more than you did up to now. But you should also learn to love film again as an art. You. Today's enemies of film shall become tomorrow's friends of film. You are the hope of film. So, for the moment, turn off all your ideas about today's cinema. Most of all, don't think of theatre and acting. We want to examine the means objectively. And then he gives a little history of film. The way he does it is worth noting. He uses almost no words. It's a very visual book which I think is a very sensible idea, if you want to explain film. <laughs> and what he's doing actually is, wait, we are moving from the city images. Yes, here we have a double page. You can actually recognize on the left side 
the very uh, scene from uh, the very shots of Symphonie Diagonal that I showed you. And what you can see what he's using are actually film scripts. So you can see what film is doing over time. On the right side, he gives you an idea of how to represent speed in cinema with this shot of the car. Um, but, sorry, I just did a glass of water. <clears throat> What he is trying to bring out basically is that the key elements of film are rhythm and montage. Sound is only briefly mentioned at the end. He nearly does not consider that. And actually, it's quite interesting. The version I showed you of this book, it's the new edition, which was made 40, 40 years later in the 60s. And in the second format, he says, everything I said 40 years ago still applies exactly the same way. If I would write the book again now, the only thing I would change are my examples for the bad films and the kitsch of commercial cinema, which is also quite amusing because if you look at this book, the examples that it takes for commercial cinema are not always what we expect, but films of people who are considered great masters of uh, the art form, people like Fritz Lang or Erich von Stroheim who are considered among the greatest fiction filmmakers. But I guess for an avant-gardist like Richter, they have sold out. In any case, Richter, like many others, will have to leave Germany very soon. He goes through the Switzerland to the US because he's fleeing from the Nazis. And actually, with the time of the Nazis, all the movements that were connected to abstract film or to avant-garde, of course, come to an end because the Nazis are, well, outlawing them. At the same time, you could say that this whole big, important avant-garde movement of the 20s also comes to an end in France at the same time, where we have the last hurrah of surrealism. But it, for a last hurrah, actually, it's only a series of highlights. There are some of the most important films in the history of cinema that happen at this point. There are films like Chemin du Lac's Le Coquille and Le Clergyman, an adaptation of a surrealist script by the great Antonin Artaud. There is, of course, the most famous of surrealist films, Un Chien Andalou by Luis Buñuel, which opens with this shocking image of an eye being cut. But what is interesting about this film, and although surrealist tendencies will play a role maybe in different ways when they are picked up again by later filmmakers, what is unique about Bonuel's film is that, unlike all the other filmmakers I've discussed up to now, who are trying to achieve very conscious artistic effects, the effect of Bonuel is so great because he's trying to be most natural. In his film on Jean Andalou, he and Salvador Dali, yet another painter before he developed it, um, tried to come up with, let's say, an something that is like a constant nightmare, a world that does not follow logic, but it's presented in the most matter of fact and casual way possible, which even enhances the idea of surrealism. At the same time, another very important filmmaker, also important to Bria, as we shall see, is Chavigo, who starts out with a documentary he makes, it's called Apropos de Nice, which is almost surrealist in the way it uh, juxtaposes the rich niece and the poor niece. And then he makes a 45 minute film called Cerro de Conduit, which is also one of the masterpieces of surrealism and of anarchism. And it's taking place in a boarding school where all the school children decide that they have had enough. They rebel against the deliberately ridiculous establishment. Here you can see a shot of the teachers. They tear up their beds. They stage a small scale revolution. And Breer, although you would consider him an animation man, actually says, somebody I always mention as having a powerful influence on me was Chavigo, who didn't make animated abstract films. His spirit of free association in Apropos de Nice, for instance, and the kind of cutting he does there moved me. And I liked Cerro de Conduit, his anarchism, his humor, and his esprit. I could identify with him. I have an aversion to just poorly abstract films, which is quite an interesting thing to say, but I think it also gives us an idea about what makes Priya himself so alive, his filmmaking so alive. He's not interested in 
trying out something abstract. He wants to find something pulsating. He wants to tell us something about his life, even if it's at first seems like a few painted doodles. <laughs> well, maybe I'm overstretching things. Anyway, what happens in the 30s is basically that avant-garde film is a movement, as we had it for this short moment in the 20s, disintegrates. Some people try things here, some people try things there, but really it's only in the 40s and actually really the post-war era that an avant-garde movement starts to happen again. Bria will come in a few years later when these first things are already on their way, which may be helpful to him. But what is interesting to me now that I've in preparation for this lecture, looked again at what will come after the war, because before the war, we have like this last gasp of French surrealism. Another person that would be of importance would be the great poet Jean Cocteau, who also makes a film called Blood of the Poet, where here you can see a very surrealist image from on the side, this moving, this rotating screen. It's almost like one of those earlier abstract films. And after the war, Again, in France, we have films like the great documentary, Blood of the Beasts by Georges Franchu, which actually just portrays a slaughterhouse. And the way he does so, it transcends the idea we have of a normal documentary. It's really surrealist in the intensity, in the violence that it shows, that the blood spurting from the animals. And of course, on the one hand, you can say it's a comment on the big slaughter of the Second World War that just happened. But on the other hand, I think it also continues this idea of how can we make cinema talk in a way that befits cinema itself, not try to frame it into a story, not try to make it into something less than a pure cinematic event, something that is exciting at very, every moment. And the same thing from very different vantage points starts to happen in the US. We have the filmmaker Maya Dern, here you can see her eye as we've <laughs> the Bunuel film before, the eye and the knife, here used very differently, a key turns into a knife. Um, um, Maya Dern made films, Meshes of the Afternoon and At Land and a few others, they pick up this surrealist idea, but in a very lyrically, in a very dreamy way. What she is beginning actually is another movement, I would argue, that includes such major figures. Here we have two more images, uh, here you see, the dream like, almost as if she's enveloped in dream, Maya Dern. Compare this with this image from Jean Cocteau's Sang the Poet, which is very stylized, very self-consciously arty. Whereas with Maya Dern, you have this dream, this idea of what in literature is called the lyrically eye. Other filmmakers who become very important avant-garde filmmakers also come in at this point. We have, for instance, Kenneth Enger, who would go on to make very different films, but one of his earliest films seen here called Fireworks is also a very personal nightmare, which also has a very subjective quality. And of course, the master of that is the great Stan Brackage, who starts filmmaking a bit later. Actually, I've also put in this, well, color photo to remind me that we are now moving into the 50s. This is actually a film of Brackage from the 50s already called Anticipation of the Night. But what you can see or maybe feel when you look at this frame is how his hand is stretching out, this subjective gesture. And what is also very important for Brackage is that many of his films are almost like what we would call today home movies, his family is in there. Here you see one of his small children. But what he does with it is he finds a way of transforming it into a completely unique poetry. And as this wave actually of new filmmaking appears, there is also a new consciousness beginning to develop. There's an era of film clubs that starts. There are things like, for instance, um, Cinema 16 in New York, founded by the emigrant Amos Vogel, a very important person who starts to show programs that are unlike what is seen in commercial cinema. He combines avant-garde film with documentary, with industrial films, even with fiction sometimes. But what he creates, and his group Cinema 16 is just the most famous one, is he, he creates also a platform where um, avant-garde filmmakers can connect through. This happens also at other places all over the US. And there is now a moment at 
the late 40s, where you can say the idea develops in the avant-garde that they are not only from different angles trying to find something, but they also find out about the history that they have had. Because, of course, in those film clubs, you will be able to see films by Bunuel or by Cocteau, but also the new films by Maya Dern, bringing it together, a sense of history envelops. And the idea begins that people start to question themselves, well, what is avant-garde film? Something very important happens in 1949 in Knocke in Belgium. There is a festival which will later be called the Experimental Film Festival. They eliminate the vowels, actually, we call it just experimental. But in the first edition, which takes place in 1949, it's called the Festival International du Film Experimental et Poetique, Experimental and Poetic Cinema. Not a bad way, maybe, to describe what this avant garde is. Only a few years later, the first book is published on what is avant-garde. It's by the great uh, German-born writer Peter Weiss, who lives in Sweden and who also works as a painter and also starts to make films. And just like we, he also starts to make films because he's not satisfied with just what painting is. He wants to achieve something more. And he's the first person to try to write the history of the avant-garde and includes most of those films that I've talked to you about. But he is also not afraid to include some fiction films. There are some filmmakers like Karl Theodor Dreyer from Denmark, who is by many avant-gardists actually allowed in their canon. But he is also not afraid to include a film like Citizen Kane, the famous Hollywood film by Orson Welles, because it says it has so many innovative ideas that in many ways it is also avant-garde. So why starts to develop these ideas? In the 50s, a second festival happens in Knocke, in Knocke, which is now already called the Festival of Experimental Film. And actually, who is represented there, among other people, is Robert Breer and a handful of other important avant-garde filmmakers, important animation filmmakers, who have continued this idea of the abstract film throughout the 30s and 40s. One of them is Norman McLaren, who began to work in Canada. He not only worked there, and who had this idea of transforming music into abstract painting. Here are two images from his film, Begon Talker, which takes a chess piece by Oscar Peterson and tries to transform it into pure movement. Another person who does this is the great Len Lai, who works in New Zealand and in Britain, actually for the post office. The British post office in the 30s uh, funds a series of films that are also considered as commercials for themselves, but mostly they give absolute freedom to the filmmakers. And so, for instance, in this film, Trade Tattoo, um, Len Lai is combining the rhythm of workaday Britain, like realistic ideas with very abstract ideas. Here you can see there is a photo, a live action photo, a live action image he uses at the background, but what he's doing, he's painting above it. He, he, he makes abstract splashes and he moves on actually to making films where he only scratches into the screen. This is from his late work, Free Radicals, which gets the main prize at Knocke in the year when Bria is also there, which is a film where the soundtrack is also very chessy. And what he's painting on the film strip is like dancing, interacting with the soundtrack. So maybe now we've reached <laughs> at least a point where we should consider sound. But instead of considering sound, actually, I want to go back to the beginning and one last time ask myself now, what actually could avant-garde film really be? Um, and for that, I cite two other avant-garde filmmakers, Hans Schweige and Ernst Schmidt Jr. They are two Austrians who wrote in the 70s a dictionary of the avant-garde and experimental films. And there is a quote in there that is quite intriguing. They write about the term avant-garde film. In the 1920s, a few like Egeling, Richter, Ruttmann, Claire, Manre, Bunuel, Cocteau, etc., found ways to make use of the collective event film for personal expression. And the only legitimate term for the works, namely art, was already occupied because it was applied wrongly to works made in industrial circumstances with the coating of individualism. The films like from David Ward Griffith, from Murnau, from Antonioni, which I guess we could all agree, they are great films, but are they really avant-garde? 
Schmidt and Schweigel make an interesting proposal, which didn't work out. They say, ah, these films or the newer films by Charlie Godard or by Alain Resné, we should call them semi-avant-garde because they are half industry and only half avant-garde because the real avant-garde film, the real experimental film, it has nothing to do with the industry. It's a personal expression. At that time, after the war, experimental film also starts to take on this. Occasionally, it is seen as ah, he makes an experimental film because it's an experiment for the feature films he wants to make. But the true experimental filmmakers, of course, reject that idea. No, you don't want to make normal feature films. What you want to do is find out what cinema itself is, to make films that are cinema, to make real experimental cinema, and actually a new self-confidence develops and leads to the founding of corps in the 1960s. It brings new ways of distribution. It makes experimental films much more visible than actually these classics we know had ever been during their lifetime because most of those films were not made with distribution in mind. But now the avant-garde says, no, we also want to be seen and rightfully so because what they are doing is maybe really film and now as an example, uh, actually, as my favorite example of how you could wind up with a working idea for what experimental film is, I again go back to Hans Schreugel, who in 2010 wrote uh, another text where he was taking part in a discussion where the terms experimental film and avant-garde film again had come under attack. And what he wrote was like, despite all these discussions in the past, experimental film and avant-garde film are still used as synonyms for those films that can be considered a part of modern art. There are three simple reasons. First, unlike in other arts, these films need a definition that distinguishes them from the mainstream. Second, no other term was found that could replace them. And third, the long history gives these two terms a stability and a practical value. He has a point there, but what really interests me is he asks himself the question, what could this really mean, experiment in art? And he gives what he himself calls an enlightening example, using the Austrian filmmaker Kurt Ken, a very important figure and also a unique figure, almost like Bria, but in a very different way of the avant-garde, who was interviewed about some of his films called Asyl, was one of them and the other two, W and B, and talked about the new techniques he uses. And he says, Kurt Ken says, that is the thing with all the films I ever did, the adventure, that I never know what the end result will be. I am not like so many other artists which repeat themselves once they found their trick. Rather, what I want is to discover something new every time, something that is new for me as well. And when I see my film on the screen for the first time, I think, oh my God, what have I done? And I have to watch my own film two times, three times, until I get it, until I get into it. And if it hadn't been that, advent that adventure, I would never have made that film. And actually, this adventure can be illustrated very well with a film by Kurt Ken himself, which he made. He was living in exile back then in Vermont, and he had found a role of expired infrared film. So he didn't know if when he makes a film with this expired film, if actually anything will result or if it's already kaput anyway. But what he's doing, he goes every day to the same spot in Vermont and films a tree, one shot of the tree, but he does not do it chronologically. He sets up a plan for the next few months and say on the first day, he shoots frame number one. On the second day, he shoots frame number 75. On the third day, frame number 12 and so on and so on until all the frames are filled. And of course, what this makes is that this film, this tree seems to dance in time, the weather changes, the sunlight changes. Actually, I want to share the film now with you. Uh, Elisa, I hope will again have the power to show you the film. Could can tree again and see how it's pulsating, how, how cinema explodes, basically. Please, Elisa.
Uh, yeah. Um, again, of course, it's not the same to see this on the small screen. Like when you see it, experience it in the cinema, it's like a storm of lightning come all, coming over you with all these changes in light and so on. But maybe you will have an option at some point to see this film on the big screen or maybe buy it on DVD. Actually, good people of six pack, if you followed the newsletters that were sent out as promoting the event by the Fondazione. One of them was made by six pack film in Austria, which is one of the good places for avant-garde films. And they, for them, you can rent the films of Kurt Gren, but you can also buy a DVD with several of his films. And I would recommend maybe you should do that to get a pure experience. But anyway, the idea that I want to get at it, this, this film was chosen to show what an experiment can be. And also because it's made of single frames, which is something that Breer will start to work with later on, and which is very important to him. And this idea of experimenting, and here I want to maybe come almost to a close with a quote by Breer, is very much the same like what Kren said. In talking about his film Recreation, Breer said, I made it in a kind of deliberate feeling of wonderment. What the hell will this look like, you know? That kind of thing. And ah, I don't want to know whether this is cinema or not. It doesn't matter. And then I would go back and try to incorporate some notions of control and construction. So it's also about Fabria, about this um, yeah, conflicting forces of freedom on the one hand, and of course the necessity to construct something like Kren also constructed, of course, a plan on how he would film this tree in time, but he could not foresee what would happen, how the weather would change, how the animals would move, stuff like that. So, so I feel it's a very good example of what experimental film can be and what its glory is. Um, so maybe to bring this full circle, the idea at the end is to relate the two film examples we've seen to two films by Robert Breer. And Elisa will show you now at the end two films that they also have in their wonderful exhibition, I guess. One is called Form Phases 4. And for Breer, actually, it was like, it's a very early film by Breer. And it's one of those where he still tries to translate paintings into cinema. And he himself said, actually, when he discovered Hans Richter, he said, um, he had done all this already in 1921, in Rhythmus 21. I guess it's pretty obvious that I'd seen that film by the time I made Form Phases 4. I got to know Richter later in New York, but I remember having that film a big impact. I lifted stuff right out of it. Yes, he did, and you will see that. But you will also see that he already brings in new ideas. And then for the end, you will see the very short two-minute masterpiece, Recreation where he's taking some of those notions of painterly and of abstraction and moving them much, much further with the single frame explosion. I hope you will enjoy that. Thank you very much.
Une surface grise brouillée, parsemée de plates taches noires, s'étend indéfiniment en tout sens et c'est précisément à 5 cm au-dessus d'elle qu'aura lieu cette recréation. Surgit brusquement d'un point de lumière vers d'art le mystérieux objet qu'entendant esquisse trois circonvolutions extrasensorielles puis s'en va se parer pour les petits lits blancs. Inimitablement circonstanciel, une grisaille opaque est un tangage à billes. Cette structure noire n'est pas ajourée malgré les apparences qui résultent la convergence fortuite d'une triple série d'oscillations se dédoublant réciproquement et non pas de la simple périodicité sous-lunaire comme on pourrait le croire. Ces jours apparents ne sont pas non plus carrés étant très légèrement incurvés vers le haut et vers le bas plein de sève populaire. Mais le passage fulgurant d'une agglomération compacte car l'un inoxydable n'est guère fait pour nous ébahir car il laisse à peine de traces et le mont septuagénaire sourit sans fin.